Okay, so good morning everyone. For today, we're going to talk about labor law. Labor law was enacted in 1974 by President Ferdinand Marcos. It prescribes rules of hiring and termination of private employees, work conditions, maximum work hours, and overtime, benefits, compensation, and guidelines for unions. Labor legislation, on the other hand, consists of uh, statutes, regulations, and jurisprudence governing the relations between capital and labor. Labor legislation covers uh, departmental orders from, for example, Department of Labor and Employment, the DOLE, or the POEA, Overseas Employment Agencies. Any uh, government agencies and or decisions of the court that governs labor. Labor standards uh, established. Uh, labor standards are standards established by law. It refers to the terms and conditions of employment that all employers must comply with and which employees are entitled as a matter of legal right. So here, here are the classification of labor laws. First one is protective legislation. Designed to protect the weaker party to the employment contract, for example, the RA-11313, VAUSI, or the uh, Violence Against Women and Children, for example, and also anti-child anti labor laws. These are protective legislations. Welfare, welfare and social legislation intended to remove or reduce the insecurity of the workers while the latter is not at work due to hazards arising from employment. These are your government mandated benefits like SSS, GSIS if you're in the government, field health and other things. Diplomatic legislation designed to settle labor, labor disputes. An example of this is ADR or alternate dis dispute resolution mediation, reconciliation, and arbitration models used by smaller courts. So, of course, what is an employer? As defined in the labor code, there is the one who employs the services of others, the one for whom employees work and who pays their wages or salaries. An employee, on the other hand, as defined by the labor code, refers to any person working for an employer. Next is the employer-employee relationship. Article 1315 of the new Civil Code of the Philippines provides the rights and obligations arising from employee-employee relationships are contractual in character. Further, Article 7 Article 7000 of the new Civil Code of the Philippines provides the relationship between capital and labor are not merely contractual in nature, but impressed with public interest that labor contracts must yield to the common good. So, what are the requisites of employer-employee relationship? There are four. First one is the manner of selection and engagement of the employee. This means that the personal authority you know, underwent a hiring procedure to determine the selection of employees. Next is the payment of wages. The employer or the person or authority is the one who pays for the wages. Number three, the power of dismissal. Of course, uh, the employer or the person in authority has the power to dismiss an employee from their duties. Last one is the presence of power to control the employee's conduct. This means that the person in authority or the employer exercises his authority over the employee for direction and or evaluation of work. So these four requisites make up the employer-employee relationship. Without one, hindi ka consider na employee ng isang employer. Next is a union. A union provides the organization in two parts, the laborers and the management. Both parties will have a representative that will act as a negotiator or both. 
So the question is, do you have the right to form or join a union? The short answer is, of course, yes. Under the 1987 Constitution, it is the right of both workers and the employees to form, join, or assist in unions for purposes of collective bargaining and negotiation or for mutual aid and protection. If you are terminated by or if you got fired because you joined a union, it is actually unconstitutional and you can sue your employers for that. So next is how do we terminate the employer-employee relationship? On the side of the employee, he or she may initiate the termination even without justifiable cause provided that the employee must tender a written notice to the employer one month from the last day of work. So it is in the 30 days notice for resignation. In the side of the employer, the employer cannot terminate an employee without just and or authorized cause provided by the labor code. So what are these just causes or authorized causes? Just causes for termination first is serious misconduct or willful disobedience. So if, for this example, if you're ka sa loob ng workplace niyo, or you are disobeying the orders from your higher ups. Second one is gross habitual neglect, meaning that you're already neglecting or pinapabayaan mo na yung trabaho mo. Number three is fraud or willful breach, may, pang, may pandoloko nang nangyayari sa trabaho mo. Number four is commission of a crime or an offense. Of course, pag karoon ng crime. An example of this is uh, insider trading. No. This is a just cause for termination. Other cause analogies to the foregoing is actually the authorized process for termination. First one is redundancy. Uh, redundancy meaning that employees are in excess from what the human resource planning uh, based from the human resource planning actually. So if, for example, in your position, uh, you have two, pero ang kailangan lang sa plan ay isa lang, these are an authorized cause for termination. Detrenchment is actually uh, eliminating excess, eliminate excess, eliminating labor to serve costs. So a perfect example of this is actually if one department is not needed anymore, it is actually, uh, it is an authorized cost for termination. Aalis ng department to save costs for the business. Installation of labor saving device, pretty much magiging automated na yung trabaho mo. Closure is, of course, self explanatory. So, service charge. All service charges collected by hotels, restaurants, and similar establishments shall be distributed at the rate of 85.15. 85% will be distributed equally to the number of employees. And 15% for the management. So why 15%? For the simplest explanation of the 15% for the management is that this is where the establishment gets its funds. To replace broken fixtures that is caused by the client. So, pag nakabasag ka ng plato, ng baso, dito kukunin ng restaurant yung pambayad mo. However, it is not, uh, however, not all establishments follow the 1850 rule. There are some establishments that give 100% of the service charge connected to the employees. Another type of charge is gratuity charge. A charge where it is added to the bill of the customer directly. Typically, it is 18 to 20 percent of the total bill, and the restaurants inform clients prior to ordering. So, ini inform nila yan na may gratuity charge for them, 18 to 20 percent. This is added directly on the bill. The 18 to 20 percent that is charged will be given directly to the wait staff. This is actually forced tipping and are present in some American restaurants. So, gratuity charge is actually the tip. Parang sino force ka na lang mag tip beforehand. This is given directly to the wait staff. Kung sino yung nag-service uh, na yung table mo, 
yun yung uh, doon mapupunta yung 18 to 20% that is being charged from your total bill so sa service charge it is equally distributed in the gratuity charge yung isa lang yung mapupuntahan yun so these are the final notes for today read please read 11313 for the Safe Spaces Act. This amends Republic Act 7877 that is actually written in your modules. That was in 1995. RA 11313 is the newer one. 11313 is the Bowel Bastos Law. There are some provisions and clauses that amends sub clauses in 7877. Yung 11313 covers even the LGBTQ+. Other topics that are not included in this uh, video lectures are for your own personal. Pretty much, hindi ko siya kinawa dito dahil it is actually defined sa modules. So, this ends the lecture for this morning. Thank you and good day.